singer-songwriter, author, columnist, Scott Alaric. Scott was born in Minnesota. He started performing as a singer-songwriter after graduating from high school. Around that time, he became actively involved in opposing the Vietnam War and joined the resistance movement. And he refused to register for the draft and was convicted for resisting and served 19 months in federal prison for his refusal. When he was released, he returned to another kind of activism, the world of folk music. He became a fixture on national folk music scene and performed out regularly on the Prairie Home Companion. And show host Garrison Keeler wrote of him, I have rarely seen an audience in such good mood as when he's been there. He went on to perform in many coffee houses and concert series uh, from Chicago to Greenwich Village to Club Passim and Metro West's own Old Vienna Coffee House. He has recorded three albums, but he did not stop there. Upon moving to Boston, Scott was invited to write for the Boston Globe about music and soon became the principal folk music writer for 25 years. And he has been called one of America's most astute music critics and chroniclers by Earl Hitchner of the Wall Street Journal. He also took on work as a radio host. Uh, he covered folk for uh, radio as well as Boston Globe, seven years of a, a correspondent for the national news here and now, and he wrote for many national magazines, including Sing Out and New England Folk Almanac. Scott has also talked about topics in folk music in colleges, museums, folk societies, music camp, and he also then began sharing his love and knowledge of folk music through writing books. Pete Seeger calls him one of the best writers in America, and Darrell Williams says he is the finest folk writer in the country. In his first book, Deep Community Adventures in Modern Folk Underground, Jeff Boudreau said, never before was the landscape of modern folk music been so comprehensively documented, prompting Library Journal to call it an essential primer to the continuing folk revival. He now has a new book, Revival, a folk music novel which has been referred to as a joyous celebration of folk musicians and their world, and has had rave reviews from folk stars like Tom Paxton, Katie Curtis, John Gorka, Ellis Paul, to name a few. He has a lot to offer from his life and his activism in, in getting others connected to the art of folk music and his own art of writing about the world of folk music and offering out his own songs. I'm so glad that he's come to Hopkinton today and look forward to hearing a small sample of his own art this morning. So please help me welcome, as he comes up here to the stage, Scott Alaric. As Cheryl mentioned, I've, uh, I've just written a novel. As, as far as I know, it's the first novel completely set in the modern folk world. And, uh, but I couldn't resist, it's a love story about two songwriters, singer-songwriters drawn together by their shared passion. Uh, it might interest some of you to know that the older songwriter, Nathan Warren, in the book is, uh, when the book begins, he is an open mic host. Yeah. Because I very much wanted to show the folk world from the community up, and not just to write sort of a star is born for folk music, but to write a book about how this wonderful community-based music lives today and, and is in so many ways, I think, the same kind of community music and social music and real people's music that it was uh, back before the music industry got involved with music and started turning it into what many people see of today, which is just a consumer product. But it probably won't surprise you to know that, that I couldn't, uh, if you're familiar with my nonfiction writing at all, to know that I couldn't write a whole novel about folk music without figuring out some way to sneak in some of my favorite true stories about folk music. So let me start with one of those. Let me put on my author glasses here. I just, I just wear these for effect. The effect is to see. For weeks, Nathan had been jotting down his favorite stories about folk music, not necessarily the most important ones, but the fun ones, the odd, mysterious, and revealing ones, the ones that felt like secrets. 
There was a story he'd heard about the old Texas blues legend Light and Hopkins. He had a few minor R&B hits in the 40s, right around the time rhythm and blues was getting its name. What Hopkins took away from the experience, more than anything, was that he should never trust a white man with a pen in his hand. And so the story goes, one fine day, Lightning found his cupboards bare. It was the dawn of the 60s folk revival, and several small record labels had expressed interest in recording him again. He always said no, but now he needed the money. He got in his car and drove to New York, the Big Apple, Gotham, the city so nice they named it twice. <laughs> Arriving at one of the labels, he told them he would record for them, but would not sign anything and would not accept a check. Cash only, one payment, and a bottle of gin. Of course, the right thing would have been to say, oh no, Mr. Hopkins, that will cost you a lot of money. Think of the royalties, sir but the label would get to keep those royalties. So they scurried to the bank and came back with a few thousand dollars in a big brown envelope and a bottle of gin. He opened both, put one in his pocket, the other in his mouth, and sang them 12 songs all in one or two takes. Everybody happy, he said when he was through. Everybody nodded, so he left, got in his car, checked his address book, and drove to the next label that had asked about recording him. He made them the same proposition, got the same deal, and drinking their gin and stuffing their big envelope in his pocket, sang them the same 12 <laughs> songs. <coughs> he repeated this process with five or six other labels over the next few days, then drove home to Houston and restocked his cupboards. <laughs> Nathan didn't know if the story was true, but he hoped it was. He did know there were a curious number of Lightning and Hopkins records from the early 60s that featured different versions of the same songs. <laughs> well, uh, here's um, now something about the two characters. Nathan Warren, I told you a little about. He was a guy who had a real good chance at stardom, signed a big major label record but there was a staff shakeup at the label and it was never released. And he was just detritus, just you know, a write-off for that fiscal year. This happens, this is a story that's happened to a lot of people in the music world. Um, and at middle age, he's convinced that he's just, his life was a complete failure. And he works as an open mic host and a folk jam, and he also hosts a folk jam and he teaches, and he kind of ignores the fact that he loves doing that. Uh, but that all gets ignited a little when he meets a young, ambitious, uh, very talented, very beautiful young songwriter named Kit Palmer, who is in every other way imaginable, completely unprepared for a career in music. And that begins to draw them together. Uh, one of the things that I, was so much a mantra for me in the book that I put it on the cover of Revival, it, it's kind of the banner line for it, we come of age more than once. And it's very much about how each of them guides the other through uh, that. This is a scene early in the book, just give you an idea of the flavor of it, and then I'll sing the song in question. Set up here. I'll be clumsy now so I can be real slick later. This is happening at the Folk Jam. Uh, Kit is, uh, grew up, like so many of the young people in folk music today, she grew up around traditional music. She, she was a Scottish fiddler and competed in Scottish, Scottish fiddle uh, contests as a little girl. And, and uh, she kind of forgot that part of her. And she's just starting to get it back during this scene. But this is mostly Nathan. Uh, whatever Nathan thinks he's doing, whatever Nathan thinks he's thinking about, Nathan is always thinking about the music. And that shows here. And he asks a question. I think anybody who likes folk music or anybody who likes poetry has probably asked themselves this troubling question at one point or another. Nathan walked down the back hall. Oh, wait a minute. I'm going to start that a little later. Kit sat with a half dozen jammers at a small table by the far end of the room. They had finished a tune and were laughing and talking in the time-honored way of the jam. Applause is considered bad form because it suggests a performance atmosphere. So after a tune, there's a period of idle chatter, sipping beers, laughing, and shuffling chairs until somebody begins another tune. There is an unspoken order to all this, but nobody really knows what it is. 
It's simply the way it's always been, since the first caveman noticed his neighbor beating on a rock, wandered over and said, hey, I got a stick too. A young guitarist in a faded Boston Celtics jersey, neatly trimmed beard stubble and Martin guitar baseball cap, suddenly began to sing a traditional cowboy song, Colorado Trail. Nathan walked closer, putting a finger over his lips when a few people started to say hi. He wanted to listen. Weep all ye falling rains, wail winds wail, all along, along, along the Colorado Trail. You could almost hear the slow padding of horses and cattle in the easy gait of the song. It vaguely tells a story about a pretty girl named Laura whom the cowboy loves and misses. But the song never explains who she is or what's happened to her. She's simply gone away. As a young man that drove Nathan crazy, he tried to learn the song a few times, but without knowing what happened to Laura or even what her relationship was to the cowboy, he didn't know how to approach it. Now he thought those omissions were brilliant because the song really isn't about Laura or even the lovelorn cowboy. It's simply about being alone in a lonely place and wishing that you weren't. Nathan certainly knew what that felt like. Bobbing his head lightly to the beat, Nathan closed his eyes and wondered what it was about sad songs that appeal to us so much. Do we like being sad? Even the up-tempo songs at the jam were usually about train wrecks, dead mothers, ghastly murders, and ghostly lovers walking these hills in long black veils. Maybe it's like those actors who say they prefer playing villains because they're more interesting. Our dark feelings have more complex palettes, at least in art they do. But Nathan had learned that form usually follows function in traditional music. Perhaps our unhappy feelings are more in need of examining than our happy ones. Who needs to solve happiness? We need to understand the dark sides of life. That's where the dangers are. Why else would cowboys have sung all those sad love songs? It was the one time they could display their inner selves, explore their feelings, and share them with friends. And those deeper feelings need attention, even on a cattle drive. Leave them alone too long, unexamined and unexpressed, and they fester like an untreated wound. Maybe that's why Colorado Trail leads us away from the particulars about Laura and the cowboy. Laura becomes everybody's absent love, and the cowboy's loneliness becomes everybody's loneliness. And doesn't the simple act of sharing that in a song make us a little less lonely? Eyes like a morning star, cheeks like a rose. Laura was a pretty girl, everybody knows. Weep all ye falling rains, well winds wail. All along, along, along the Colorado. through the day keep that herd moving on moving on its way we all ye falling rains well winds way all along 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 the Colorado trail ride through the stormy night Dark is the sky Wish I'd stayed in Abilene Where it's mighty warm and dry We all ye falling rains Well winds way All along, along, along The Colorado Trail like a prairie flower laughing all the day Laura was a pretty girl now 
now she's gone away We party fall in grace Well winds wait All along, along, along the Colorado Trail All along, along, along the Colorado Trail Notice how slick that was, the way I dropped that thing, right? Yeah. Boy, I tell you, that's showbiz. <laughs> I wanted to explore the process of, of songwriting through the, through the book, and Nathan Warren ended up being an ideal subject for it, because as the book begins, he hasn't written a book or a song for years, and he's just decided that that part of his life is over, that he's fallow, that he's all dried up, that he doesn't have anything else to say to the world, but then he falls in love. And you know, that, that makes us stupid in a lot of ways. And it makes us stupid in a lot of ways that make us a lot smarter, so. I don't think there's, there's no art, certainly no art form I've dabbled in that is more dependent on serendipity than songwriting. That's more dependent on this distant thing called the muse. At one point, Nathan, kind of frustratingly thinking about that, says that the, the ancients decided to call this the muse because they didn't know what the heck it was either. But you kind of have to wait for songs to come. A lot of times you'll hear songwriters say, I, 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 it took me three years to write this song. It doesn't mean that they were like Michelangelo getting up in 10 hours a day working on it, you know, like the Sistine Chapel, but that they would write a verse and then they'd be stumped and they'd go away. And, if any of you have written a song, and this probably happens with writing poetry too, you, you'll come back to it and find that it's made progress on its own. Um, and I try to show that process sort of painstakingly happening throughout the book. But this is how this book begins. Gives you a little idea of, of their relationship too, I think. Nathan was sweeping the kitchen floor, humming quietly to the slow swish of the broom. He stopped suddenly, realizing he was remembering the melody to an old unfinished song. He hadn't thought of it in years, but always meant to finish it someday. Why had it come back to him now? He walked into the living room, picked up his guitar, and sang the first two lines. Make me well, someone break the spell that's kept me down since first I fell. He sang it again and laughed, remembering the self-pitying lament he tried to write after that opening couplet. Pompous young twit. He hadn't even liked the girl who inspired it. He just hadn't liked the idea of her dumping him. It had been nothing but vanity, pure, foolish vanity. No wonder he couldn't finish it. It wasn't true. Maybe that's why it came back to him after all these years. Maybe he'd grown up enough to know what to write after those first two lines. He felt a faint tickle of inspiration, the strange feeling that ideas were forming into words in that place beneath our conscious thoughts. He'd always liked the melody and felt it had something to say. There must be some reason it returned to him today. But it had been such a long time since he'd written anything. The old fear flashed through him. What makes you think you can relight the old dead fires of inspiration? Keep them cold. They're safer that way. They can't burn you. Always a reason to not do something. But then he thought about Kit during those nor'easters, alone and hurt, wondering what she had done to drive him away and writing that beautiful new song, turning her feelings inward and then outward to the way we all feel when winter makes us seem so alone in the world. He tentatively touched the guitar as if it was something strange and new in his arms. His fingers fl faltered and fluttered from the strings. He was afraid. It had been so long 
so long. But then he realized he was feeling something different, more recent, not the familiar specters of cold ash and dead ember, the memory of wood. It did not bring the familiar pain, but something that tingled excitedly, expectantly beneath the fear. What was it? He smiled and caught his breath. Oh, that. He realized that his fingers felt on the strings the way they had at the first touch of Kit's soft skin, the first time they made love. How his hands had fluttered and faltered on her shoulders and along her arms and back. And how she'd smiled at him, warmly, safely, and leaned into his hands until they found their firmness. He closed his eyes, keeping that smile inside him, and began to play. He pressed his fingers down until the old sureness returned. Since there are a lot of uh, poets and songwriters in the audience, I'm sure there are a lot of poets and songwriters watching this on TV. Um, after he writes for a little bit, let me give you this final little graph here where he stops and I'll tell you what I was talking about, about that dependency on serendipity that, we, that songwriters have. Enough for today, let it breathe a while, incubate. It's an amazing thing about songs. You can leave them alone, then return to find that they've made progress on their own, like they're living things. And then suddenly they seem to have their own energy. Nathan used to call it the Pinocchio moment, when the piece of wood comes to life. From that moment on, a song participates in its own creation. That's when you know you've got a real song, and you know it viscerally. It's euphoric like the best rush from the best drug in God's own pharmacy. Thank you. I actually remember back in the 70s reading an interview uh, uh, with Paul Simon where he described what that moment feels like and he said, if they could package that as a drug, I would spend all my money on it. <laughs> well, let me, f let me finish with uh, Another true story, it seems a, a perfect way to end this show with its theme uh, on activism. And again, uh, in that list of activists, uh, um, Cheryl forgot one that, that should be mentioned, and that's Cheryl Perot, of course. So thank her for, for doing this. This is where human art continues to begin, like Tim was saying, like water, like uh, cracking gently through stone, that it just keeps popping back up and popping back up every time they think they've got it stamped down. Uh, good people like, like Cheryl and all the people here at HCAM find some crack in the stone and, and let people make art for each other the way art was designed to be. Well, this is probably my all time favorite true story about folk music. And it is about a guy who really helped define the relationship between folk music and activism and is continuing to do it. Fame is a funny duck in the folk world. Folk's notion of fame has always been both larger and smaller than the kind of fame pop culture celebrates. Nathan wanted to explore that because it showed some essential demarcation points between folk and the mainstream music industry. He knew a couple of stories that fit the bill. In the 1970s, Pete Seeger was invited to sing in Barcelona, Spain. Francisco Franco's fascist government, the last of the dictatorships that started World War II, was still in power, but declining. A pro-democracy movement was gaining strength, and to prove it, they invited America's best-known freedom singer to Spain. More than 100,000 people were in the stadium where rock bands had played all day, but the crowd had come for Seeger. As Pete prepared to go on, government officials handed him a list of songs he was not allowed to sing. <laughs> Pete studied it mournfully, saying it looked an awful lot like his set list. <laughs> but they insisted he must not sing any of these songs. Pete took the government's list of banned songs and strolled on stage. He held up the paper and said, I've been told that I'm not allowed to sing these songs. He grinned at the crowd and said, 
So I'll just play the chords. Maybe you know the words. They didn't say anything about you singing them. He strummed his banjo to one song after another, and they all sang. A hundred thousand defiant freedom singers breaking the law with Pete Seeger, filling the stadium with words their government did not want them to hear, words they all knew and had sung together in secret circles for years. What could the government do? Arrest a hundred thousand singers? It had been beaten by a few banjo chords and the fame of a man whose songs were on the lips of the whole world. Folk is thought of as a fringe music, but what rock star has that kind of fame? Which of the world's great pop stars could have done what Pete Seeger did, knowing that a hundred thousand people from another country speaking another language would know the words to the songs he came to sing for them, and that they would rise and do it in defiance of their government. That is fame. Scott's been a supporter of folk music through his interpretation of folk songs and his own original compositions. He has a deep understanding of the folk community and the roots of the music, the evolution of folk music over the centuries. As a folk music writer for the Globe, he supported many events and performers and called attention to many new and upcoming artists. He has also been a presenter of many events in which he performed, but also included other artists. He is a fine writer. His earlier book, Deep Community, and his novel, Revival, have been very well received.